the Hayflick limit. This is the trait that, due to the limitation of cell division, dooms our lives to end someday. When the cell division in our body ceases, as living creatures, we age and die. Modern science seeks to delay this moment and extend human life, but death is completely inevitable. Most of all, the scary thought is that we permanently lose our consciousness as it will end forever. But what if you digitize your consciousness? As of yet, we're not able to do this. No modern computer can even come close to replicating one millionth of what the human brain is capable of. But this is not a reason to abandon digital immortality. After all, you can preserve your nervous system until the time when digitization will become routine. To do this, you'll first need to freeze your brain. Already, many companies such as Nestome offer the service for only $10,000, a small price to pay for immortality. However, in order to preserve not just a piece of gray matter sealed in the box of your skull, but directly the consciousness itself, you need to preserve the brain connectome. That is, the structure of all the connections of your nervous system. This means that each neuron and synapse, the contact between nerve cells, must be in the same condition as before freezing. This will not be an easy task, but if you want to be around to witness the end of the world and the colonization of other planets, then you need to try and make an effort. So. Make sure your brain is well treated with glutaraldehyde. This is a special yellowish liquid that can preserve your synapses and prevent them from disintegrating. This substance maintains its properties even at temperatures up to 17.6 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about minus 8 Celsius. But when the brain freezes, the temperature can drop even lower. To prevent your nerves from ending in collapse, you should soak your brain with ethylene glycol, a type of alcohol that will help turn your brain into a glassy mass. But in this form, it'll be able to withstand ultra-low temperatures. Now that your consciousness is sealed and preserved, you need to read all the information from it. Therefore, the next step will be emulation of the brain, that is, the reconstruction of all your nerve connections on a computer. This will take a very long time since a person has about 86 billion neurons, as well as hundreds of trillions of synapses. For comparison, a roundworm has only 302 neurons, and 7,000 synapses. I didn't just choose this creature as an example at random either, because scientists have already recreated the worm's nervous system in a robot. The Open Worm Project participants scan neurons and their connections in a nematode worm and place the nervous system in a LEGO Mindstorms EV3 robot. The robot has parts that almost completely correspond to the parts of the body of the nematode. As a result, the robot began to move like a real nematode without any additional programming. True, creating a digital description of this small nervous system took researchers about 12 years. Another success that scientists have been able to achieve is the creation of an electronic map of the brain of a fly with 100,000 neurons. Therefore, at this pace, it might take about three and a half billion years to fully digitize a single human brain with modern computers. Nevertheless, in order to recreate a full-fledged electronic map of your brain, regardless of whether you're frozen or not, first, you would need to die. This would be in order to cut each cubic millimeter of the brain into approximately 25,000 parts. In order to complete this tedious work, it's necessary to clear the brain of blood, after which it's necessary to cut layers just one micron thick and photograph the connections of nerve cells and the density level of their receptors. Each layer must then be scanned with an electron microscope that displays all of your neurons. Then, 
After all the information about your brain is gathered, it must be transferred into an electronic medium. Only a supercomputer can handle this. Alternatively, you could choose BlueGene, whose performance reaches 20 petaflops, that is, more than 20 quadrillion floating point operations per second. This computer can simulate your brain, including each neural column, a structural unit of the cerebral cortex. Each neuron in a column has the same function. The column itself consists of six layers, each with the thickness of a credit card, and with a total number of neurons of between 1,000 and 10,000. So far, scientists have only managed to simulate just one column of a mouse brain. To simulate 10,000 neurons, about 8,192 computer processors were needed. The resulting model took up about 100 gigabytes. So, in comparison, the human brain will need at least 1 billion gigabytes of memory and about 82 billion processors. But never mind how much computing power this will require. This huge amount of information needs to be stored somewhere. According to researchers, by 2025, there will be approximately 163 zettabytes on all electronic devices on the planet, which is 163 billion times more than on a one terabyte hard drive. This brings humanity closer to the so-called Bekenstein bound, the limit of information that can be contained in certain volumes when using the maximum amount of energy. Simply put, there will be so much data on our planet that all the supercomputers put together simply cannot accommodate it, not to mention the countless terabytes of your brain. Therefore, another storage medium is needed. Scientists believe that individual atoms or fragments of artificial DNA can become a new kind of storage. Biologists and geneticists at the Wyss Institute at Harvard University managed to put 5.5 petabytes of data, that is about 700 terabytes, into one gram of DNA. The human genome has hundreds of thousands of DNA strands and consists of approximately 20,000 genes, a third of which encode the brain. Directly in your brain, there are about 5,000 strands of DNA, weighing about 1.2 picograms, or 1.2 times 10 to the negative 12 grams. This is not enough to hold one's consciousness, but still more compact than digital media. Therefore, it's much more convenient to record your consciousness in your own genetic material. However, there is one problem. Scientists believe that even if we put information into every subatomic particle on the planet, with the current speed of data generation, in about 345 years, we'll run out of space. Even if we delete all unnecessary data, such as bad memories, unfunny memes, and bots from social networks, it still won't be enough. Then you have to use the atoms from the entire solar system, or even the galaxy. But this will require a tremendous amount of energy. In addition, all these atomic storage media need to be kept somewhere. But even if it's possible to overcome all of the technical difficulties and use all the resources of the observable universe, the biggest question remains. Will the digital copy be completely identical to your personality? After all, your consciousness is significantly dependent on your physical body. Hormones, which are secreted in other parts of the body that are not even related to the brain, largely determine your emotional state. Even those substances that are produced directly by the brain, for example, dopamine, which influences will and motivation, or serotonin, which provides good mood, cannot be converted to a digital medium. Another point is that gender, appearance, and physical skills, whether it's the ability to draw, play the guitar, or snowboard down a mountain slope, largely determine your place in society and shape your worldview. Without all of this, there's a risk of being nothing more than a disjointed data set. 
Now, imagine for a second that the technology to digitize your brain is already available today. As shown in the famous series Altered Carbon, your consciousness has already been transferred to a computer, but you still remain alive. Or let's even complicate the situation further and suppose there are several copies of your personality. Each is located in a different place and accordingly will be occupied with different activities. You will continue to do your usual business. The first copy will start to learn foreign languages. The second will go on a trip around the world. And the third, for example, will spend its days exchanging funny memes with friends. Then you die and leave behind three digital yous. Which of them will actually represent you if they've all had different experiences? Write your thoughts on this in the comments below this release. If you like my video, give it a thumbs up and click on the bell. See you in the next episode.